Hello, welcome to the latest MoLab conversation. Today we are going to discuss about linked and distributed mobility. In a way, it is banal to say that the movements of people, movements of things, of information and energy are interrelated. And they are also distributed in the sense that people of different positions move in different way, yet the different type of mobilities are interrelated. So in this sense, they are distributed, right? So they are structured uh, in a non-random way. It is in a way commonsensical, but we wanted to uh, investigate more because in the current world, we see more and more businesses as well as the government interventions are consciously making new connections among the mobilities of people or mobilities between different things. In this process, things are often taken apart in order to move more quickly and of course in the process there are different things are also assembled together in, in which, uh, during which process they acquire new values and new meanings. So today I'm very pleased to have uh, Yuli Pesel to join me to discuss this topic. Yuli is currently a visiting fellow at the Department of Economic uh, Experimentation at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. But uh, her main duty, I understand, is you're doing your PhD study uh, in Manchester University on a project of e-waste in India. Yuli, welcome, and thank you very much for joining me. To start off, I wonder whether or not you can uh, give us an overview about the circulation or mobility of things uh, in the case of e-waste. In a sense, I understand, you know, especially in countries like India, there's no, never pure e-waste, right? Like a radio, any piece of small thing, that if it's a, something electronic, actually they're always cherished uh, even after its death. But I understand that there's a huge change in terms of how these e-wastes are treated and how new values are being assigned to e-waste and how this whole process is organized commercially and socially. Or probably you can tell us about either the historical change or the structural change. Yeah, there's an overview of e-waste circulation in India. Right, thank you very much for having me. Um, so, Yes, it is, um, it is quite a misnomer to call uh, e-waste waste because in, in effect uh, it never actually attains that status what we ascribe to waste mm -hmm. normally that where it uh, loses value and is discarded either to a landfill or any other place. Uh, e even though oftentimes the, um, the writings about e-waste like to give that um, impression that it ends mm. up in a landfill and that's where it kind of starts to ex um, exude uh, toxic chemicals um, mm -hmm. and becomes really harmful to the environment. In, in effect, e-waste, as you said, gets taken apart in complex processes and is sold and resold in intense markets of exchange all mm. over India. Mm -hmm. um, um, and this has been going on probably for the past, at least for the past 20 years, if not mm -hmm. long, probably mm -hmm. longer. Mm -hmm. And um, because the first uh, report about um, the harms of e-waste and how and the effects that it has on workers and the environment came fr from 2003 by the Toxic Links, um, Toxic Links, which is a which is an NGO in Delhi working oh. on uh, mm. toxicity and mm -hmm. advocating for a change, uh, legal change mm -hmm. um, around toxic subjects, mm -hmm. and they uh, presented this. Um, situation, this, this report about um, how e-waste is being shipped to India from the US mainly at that time 
and is uh, sort of taken apart and recycled in mm. backyard operations without proper uh, protective personal protective mm -hmm. equipment and any sort of security measures but as as the time times changed india or um as Indians also became uh, more of consumers of electronic goods, this pattern of uh, US to India mm. um, shipment, export mm -hmm. of uh, toxic goods actually turned around and now India produces its quite a significant amount of its own electronic waste. Mm. So now what we see or what it looks like is that the domestic production of uh, electronic waste is much more significant. I see. Mm -hmm. So that is one change. It's a very interesting. You know, probably we, we went through three phases, right? Number one probably is a domestic produced waste and a domestic uh, recycling. And then you have international import of waste. And then it became kind of a political issue, right? Yes. So therefore you have toxic uh, concern. I mean, uh, concern about toxic effects. Uh, came into picture, and then the stage three is again domestically, produ domestically produced waste and the dom domestic market for the circulation of the waste. If we compare phase three to phase one, can you tell us what is the key changes in terms of how the whole e-waste e circulation is structured now in a different way as compared to 30 years ago, for instance. Right. So I guess um, oftentimes when you talk about waste in India, uh, um, there's always a reference to sort of pre-consumer, pre-liberalization -liberal era when people used to, you know, get their grains from the market and uh, you use domestically everything and recycle just as just by default or their mm -hmm. or the stuff that was used domestically mm -hmm. and radios and uh, other sort of smaller electronic items that started making um, their appearances were you know repaired forever mm -hmm. and sort of cherished as uh, mm -hmm. valuable items and this you know, as um, I mean, Asa Doron and uh, Robin Jeffrey write, wrote a really mm -hmm. interesting book about this. So it's not really my my research, but this has kind of uh, shifted over the last 20, 30 years uh, with India becoming more of a consumer society with the rise of the middle classes mm -hmm. and, um, you know, claiming status through consumer Mm -hmm. consumption, fast-moving electronic goods became very important mm -hmm. uh, domestically. So in a situation where everything, from like a situation where everything was dealt with domestically, everything was repaired and mm -hmm. uh, passed down mm -hmm. through generations or to through different classes even, mm -hmm. um, now we see a situation where uh, there's a lot more Mm -hmm. uh, electronic goods mm -hmm. on the market, which mm -hmm. become obsolete very fast, mm -hmm. right? Because these uh, things are designed for obsolescence. Mm -hmm. What uh, needs to be also highlighted here is that um, what becomes obsolete doesn't always, as as I already said, doesn't really become waste. So, for example, mm -hmm. one of the ways in which uh, used electronics get a second life, for example, is to be assembled into um, desktops that are rented out for IT firms or uh, smaller IT firms or for, um, um, you know, startups or um, what are they called? The and IT? Service centers, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that becomes... Because of the wide availability of sort of used electronics goods, the entry into these uh, spheres becomes cheaper as well because mm. you can use older technology that's mm. been discarded. Mm. But with as with anything, some parts actually become 
usually, you know, they don't work anymore. And then what happens is um, they enter into these um, interns, intense markets of buying and selling. I mean, there's a, there's already a used electronics market where they buy mm -hmm. and sell for items that actually work mm -hmm. and can be given a new life. But there's mm -hmm. also a, a very big uh, all India mm -hmm. um, circulation of old electronics that don't know, that are being that need to be taken apart, mm -hmm. and it's uh, done by a. Um, so one one prominent group that I worked with, and mm -hmm. they claim they they control, uh, you know, a largest share of the market mm -hmm. um, is the, is a group of uh, people called the Maliks, who mm -hmm. are Muslim telis from eastern uh, western Uttar Pradesh from around Merat, mm -hmm. and they have been in the Kabariwala business, the the sort of scrap dealer business, for even longer sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they operate these, in a sense, uh, all India collection system, mm. uh, but it's not, it, not an official collection system where they um, uh, send um, relatives off to these regional outposts in mm. India where they collect electronic mm -hmm. stuff that gets discarded from households. Mm -hmm. They collect it and then send it to Delhi where this group had settled now for around 20 years. Mm. So that's fascinating, Julie. I'm thinking, you know, probably 30 years ago, uh, uh, electronic goods will go through recycling temporarily. You know, after you the five years, you repair and then you try to uh, make other use of it, without a spatial circulation. But the now is that the temporal recycling is replaced by spatial circulation, right? Once it stops working, or even it's perfectly workable, but you don't want it anymore, and it ends life in this household. And then it will travel across India to find the new users or to be taken apart. So now we think of the spatial circulation of these goods. And why is it structured in this way? I mean, the circulation is structured in that, this way. It's collected from different India and then sent to Delhi, I suppose it's a center. What is the logic behind this? What will happen after being sent to Delhi? I see. Um, well, Delhi is a bit of an odd center for uh, e-waste recycling mm -hmm. um, because it's not near a port. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Um, which is what um, uh, most of these e-waste uh, recycling hubs around the world, like Accra, Ghana, or even in China, mm. um, and other ones that have come up more recently, they're all sort of uh, centering around port areas where mm -hmm. the imported goods are um, treated in uh, similar ways. In Delhi, it's potentially because of its uh, its uh, commercial center. It's become a commercial center in the last twenty years, um, but also. This group, if it's true that this group kind of <laughs> controls this mm -hmm. trade, which mm -hmm. is what they claim, mm -hmm. or the most visible part of this trade, because there are other communities working in different mm -hmm. parts of the of the value chain, mm -hmm. um, it's because that was the nearest uh, place for for them. So Meerat and Delhi are actually quite close, a few okay. hours drive, mm -hmm. and uh, members of the community. Uh, or this caste settled mm -hmm. uh, in northeastern part of Delhi, so where you mm -hmm. enter the city first. I see. So um, that here you see the link between how things circulate and how people move, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what happened afterwards? I mean, when they arrive in Delhi, what will happen? So actually, beyond the domestic. Uh, production. I think we, I need to say that also mm -hmm. before that beyond the uh, domestic production of, or the sort of household, the stuff that comes out of households, the most significant part of e-waste comes from uh, private uh, 
offices and mm -hmm. um, the pub uh, and the public sphere, the government mm -hmm. uh, sphere. Mm -hmm. It's about so the number is supposed to be around seventy percent. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that members of the Malik caste do is to take part in government auctions, um, which are aim to to dispose of uh, waste that comes from these offices in uh, a responsible way. They, mm. These uh, people need to be licensed and everything mm -hmm. and have these um, numbers that they can log on to the internet system and things mm. like that. Mm. Um, and that's where the bulk of the uh, material comes from, mm -hmm. especially uh, CPUs, central processing units and mm -hmm. screens and things like that. And and the and the people who do this also the regional collection or the household to household mm -hmm. collection and the people who go to the um, government offices they're all called feri feri maliks the people who they're the hawkers oh. you know like mm -hmm. hawkers who go around and they when they have enough stuff in a location they pack it up into a lorry. And they send it to Delhi, mm. or they take it to Delhi themselves. And when it gets to Delhi, um, they either already have their contacts when they know who wants to buy what they yes. have. Mm -hmm. So it goes on a familiarity basis. Mm -hmm. Or if they don't, they can't get rid of their stuff that way. Then they um, park their lorries close to, there's a couple of these recycling cent or like these e-waste markets in northeast Delhi and they park their lorries, let down the hatches and then everyone can come and, not everyone. Mm -hmm. on the, the it's an open e market. The people it's, it can. becomes an open market. Mm. So you can see through this circulation, so waste acquire new commercial value in a way. Uh, and I understand that now, of course, uh, e-waste or waste in general or circular economy uh, also become a site that attract capital investment, right? Because it's, I mean, on one hand, it's supposed to be ecologically friendly, sustainable development. And on the other hand, it seems to be a new frontier of uh, profit making. So is something happening there as well? You know, capital enters this uh, circular economy. Right, so um, the idea of circular economy is, um, is really becoming uh, attractive to, or, 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 it may, or it's, a, it's, sort, it's a language to sort of make big um, industrial players also interested in environmental. Mm -hmm. Uh, practices because circular economy promises you know unending resources and um, regeneration and production without um, side effects or without ex externalities like waste that have to be disposed of and they cost money to be dispose of them so in India right now there's a huge sort of push to uh, get uh, on the one hand to get um, investment mm. into e-waste recycling and so therefore there's a lot of uh, reports that are sort of calculating the um, the in investment potential of e-waste uh, but at the same time there's also a law that's been uh, not it's the e-waste management rules of 2016 mm -hmm. which have been notified in 2017 uh, which make it um, compulsory for large electronics producers like you know large brands uh, that produce computers TVs phones uh, even air conditioners and mm -hmm. washing machines um, that they need to um, take responsibility for the cons post-consumption waste that comes out of their sales and make sure a certain percentage of their yearly sales that become obsolete go goes into formal, um, registered and responsible recycling uh, 
um, channels. Oh, mm-hmm. And so that is already creating a situation. It's, mm. it's based on the EPR, the Extended Producers Responsibility mm-hmm. um, principle, which is already in place in Europe. Mm-hmm. since the 90s, but in India it's a very new thing. Mm. And um, it's also sourcing um, the required um, funds to uh, to treat electronic waste. Because mm. actually when you do it in the formal channels, it be- oftentimes it can become... Uh, some, some aspects and some parts of it can become negative value. So, for example, disposing of uh, leaded uh, glass mm. in CR- old CRT monitors, that's a negative uh, that pe- n- n- companies need to pay to get rid of that. So to foot that bill, uh, they are um, bringing in, um, or they are, they are sourcing that money from producers by law. That's okay. the that's the ideal. I see. It's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very interesting. Now we're talking about at least three channels for the circulation of e-waste. One is that you know cost based and regional based, but the nationwide networks. Number two, you have this officially designated formal channel, and the number three, you said is also capital investment uh, who are not made by the producer. It's the third sector. How the three are related? Oh, they are not related. Um, well, um, I think they are working on linking these channels up. Mm-hmm. And uh, one really interesting player in this um, in this um, effort to link up these channels is mm. a um, is the the category of a company called the PRO Producers Responsibility Organization, mm-hmm. which is the 2016 laws make provision for this kind of uh, um, entity, which is a, 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 a company that works on helping large producers uh, fulfill their law mandated responsibilities. Mm. So I worked with one uh, yes. company mm. like mm. this. Mm-hmm. Um, I call the company Sahikam. Um, mm-hmm. That's my pseudonym for them. It means in Hindi, the right work or the right <laughs> way to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have been... So this company especially has been really active in working together with... Uh, Producers, so electronics companies, big brands, international and local brands, uh, as well as international organizations that are trying to foster investment in the business. So there's a sort of a push to invest in recycling plants and uh, reverse logistic channels. of which there's already quite a bit, but they operate in a, a sort of shady way. Mm-hmm. That's a different mm-hmm. different topic. And then this company, the one I worked with, they also work very closely with uh, members of the of the cast, the Malik cast, mm-hmm. because they buy up waste to fulfill producers' uh, targets that need to be channeled into official recycling. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so they have this like two-way communication, which mm-hmm. I found really interesting. So they need to kind of capture corporate interests as well as local and uh, mm-hmm. of a certain of a, a totally different sphere. Mm. So this company, you know, uh, you work with, they make money primarily uh, due to the government-imposed uh, obligation. Uh, over big manufacturers, uh, and uh, then probably partly uh, through genuine circulation. Just uh, you know, you you buy uh, the goods at a lower price, but you sell it after repackaging. And this. so, the, is that the correct analysis of the main source of profit? And which one is big? And also, actually, I guess my question: is How you salarize that? I and mean, how should they understand this type of value? that it is there and then materialized by this type of company. How should we understand that? Well, the theory part mm-hmm. is really interesting, and I 
don't know yet. This is what mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out through my thesis. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm... Um, sorry, what was the, uh, the first part of your question? I got very... Oh, no, the two sources of profits, is that correct? Uh, yes, yeah. that, mm -hmm. that's right. So what they mm -hmm. do is they um, sell these packages to mm -hmm. uh, producers... That, that that kind of that includes uh, uh, the service of filling their paperwork mm -hmm. to the government to mm -hmm. the CPCB, the Central Pollution mm -hmm. Control Board, mm -hmm. but also uh, they decide the targets that the company because not all so most uh, producers prefer to do their own collection. So it's optional to work with these companies mm -hmm. as well. So that mm -hmm. makes their work really hard kind mm -hmm. of to to get to capture this market mm -hmm. um and because they want to capture this market they have been working to the you know the perfection of environmental logic and respond and responsibility and accountability which is why they became very really interesting for me mm -hmm. but the other interesting part is so their struggle this is all, their source of profit but this is also their struggle because mm -hmm. actually when they buy up waste, mm -hmm. they don't buy it very cheap because the intense networks that I've already talked about, they actually, the, these goods have really high value mm -hmm. because they contain uh, gold, they contain silver, they contain uh, copper. So the value of these goods is already high in the informal, or what they term the informal sector. And actually when, when the companies sell when the company sells the goods to, uh, or, or the, the waste to uh, the official recyclers, they don't get that high, that high value for it. Mm -hmm. So there is a mismatch between what you get for the same material in uh, official circuits and in uh, unofficial circuits, mm -hmm. which is really difficult. This is also why it's very difficult for them to kind of uh, make these links between the different spheres of circulation. That's, I mean, you're very interesting. I think this is what we need, probably economists as well as economic anthropologists to come in, right? You do need, there's such a thing to figure out the right pricing mechanisms in order for this mode to become sustainable. Uh, so who are these people? I mean, uh, these uh, startup companies who fulfill obligations for manufacturing by buying uh, wastes and uh, and uh, uh, circulating them. I mean, it belong to a particular social group or caste again, or right. So PROs are in general can be of different types. Um, often recyclers who've already been in the business, they've started setting up PROs. Um, but the one that I worked with and I was really interested in um, is actually um, founded by and run by internationally uh, mobile people mm. um, uh, with an experience of environmental science and or a background and uh, corporate social responsibility and corporate environmental kind of measures. So they really have the expertise of how to think about environmental issues in a corporate uh, context. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, um, many of this, the the employees that I worked with, they were actually um, associated to um, environmental programs in Europe. So mm -hmm. what's really peculiar about that is that even the the legal framework or the policy framework EPR um, is. Um, is a sort is a sort of adaptation of the European framework mm -hmm. for managing uh, these goods, but even beyond that, they have a cultural experience, they have a social, you know, a migration experience of having been to Europe and how it's done there, mm -hmm. and they have an imagination, or there is a collective imagination at least in the company that mm -hmm. we need to do this to those kind of standards. Mm. So that's a fascinating. Again, that is a quite relevant to a sub theme that we wish to explore as well under the theme of linked and distributed mobilities, namely how expertise and knowledge becoming more important in facilitating and conditioning mobilities. Right? As you said, these people 
come in are not only circulating e-waste as goods, but also they are circulating knowledge, circulating discourses, and of course, materially circulating all the forms and the certificates to satisfy the need of cooperation, right? Yuli, thank you very much for this conversation. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you. much for the chance.